Our next speaker is Andy Lowe, who's well known for his being the inspirational force behind the eco sanctuary at Cape Kidnappers. Andy. Morning, everyone. Um, I'm probably the only non scientist here. Um, I didn't go to university. Um, I started from the ground up working on production floors. I'm a pragmatic industrialist. Um, I'm involved in the leather industry. We process and market over 30 New Zealand hides and pelts. Uh, that's dealing in nasty chemicals like chromes and sulphides and everything else. Other businesses we're involved in is waste recycling. Um, we pick up dead cows from farms to um, waste from meat works. We process 50% of the chicken waste out of chicken factories. Um, uh, fish from butcher shops, fish waste, supermarkets. So, and we're involved in farming. So, how did Andy Lowe get involved in, um, in, in being involved in conservation? I'm also a hunter. And um, part of being a hunter and going to the bush when I was a little five year old, I used to love listening to the birds and watching the birds and, um, and the bird sound. And just over the next 20 years, I just noticed the bush became dead. New Zealand, we, we had trees, but we're a desert. And um, I got talking to a few people like Dr. John McLennan and, and a few others, and I said, we've got to do something about this. And um, the first thing that came to me was, what is sustainability? To some people, sustainability was, was, was going to a native forest and putting their arms around a tree and hugging the last cowrie. Um, to a farmer, sustainability was making a profit. To a recreational person, sustainability was being able to go and surf and, and, and use our native parks, national parks, and, um, and, and, and do everyday uh, recreational things. And also, sustainability is somewhere where we live. So the philosophy, as you see up here, is um, to create a peninsula where our endangered species can coexist with human inhabitation, recreation, and food production. Um, Everyone thought we were mad when we started, it was impossible. But I was lucky, I met with a guy called Julian Robertson who happened to be a neighbour. Um, he's got deeper pockets than me, but we decided to go halves in this project and, um, and we pushed through. And, I'll, and, and, and some of the biggest um, threats to this whole project working were people in this room, all scientists. So, but I'll go through that later on. Um, Where is Cape Century? Just for you don't know, Cape Century's in Hawke's Bay. It's Cape Kidnappers. Um, it's 2,500 hectares behind a wire fence. Now, um, it's an interesting bit of land because what we've got here is we've got, behind this fence, we've got sheep farming. Um, well, so we've got sheep farming. Um, we've got cattle farming. We've got people who want to be able to use the beaches for recreation, so we can't cut the beaches off to stop people going up and down the beaches. Uh, Julian Robertson just spent tens of millions of dollars on a golf course, so we had a golf course. Um, we've got people, we harvest crops, so there's harvesting going on. There's pine forests, so there's people in there milling pine forests and cutting down trees. Um, so as you can see, and then also we've got a couple of NIM sites for, uh, which we've created in them sites of sand dunes and a Kaunika forest. So as you can see, we've got a, a wide, diverse um, um, use of land. And the experts were telling us that, hey, there's no way you can put stuff at the Cape. One, it's too dry. Two, how dare you put some birds which could get caught up on a combine harvester. Three, if you're harvesting pine trees, um, what say you kill a tree, kiwi because you drop a pine tree on a kiwi? Um, and four, um, your, your fence isn't going to the edges, so it's not a foolproof fence. Now, right from the start, we decided that we weren't going to be vermin free. Vermin free was going to cost us 10 times more than trying to be 95% vermin free. And so our whole project was about. Uh, and we're just a big scientific experiment was about trying to find out where the break points were for different vermin um, for the different species. 
We didn't want to build a fence, but in the day with the technology which was around 10 years ago, we had to build a fence. Um, now, I want to make thing, one thing very clear. That fence is temporary. If we have to rebuild that fence in 20 years' time, we've failed. So the whole idea about Cape to City, and I think Cam was going to talk Cape to City, is moving out from Cape Century and making the wider landscape pest-free or to a pest-free level where we don't need to have a fence. So we're not about fences. How did our project work? When we started, we had, uh, talking 15 years ago, uh, we were nutcases. We had the, a lot of the green movement was saying the, the boom proof fence is to keep people out of a private lodge. Um, how dare you put these endangered species where 75% uh, of the land is farmland. Um, there's a few pine trees there. There's a bit of carnica forest which is grazed and some sand dunes. Um, and then we also were told, well, were these things here before? If these things were, weren't here before, you cannot put these things back. We were very lucky that there were some paleofauna sites, which um, um, I think it was Holdsworth, Holdsworth, had done a lot of work on and found a lot of these species had survived here in the past in our sand dunes. So um, right back to ravens, which become extinct 2,000 years ago, mowers, tuatara, so everything we we proved everything we've brought back is, um, was actually lived there at some stage in the past. I, I think the main success of our project has been the collaboration. We were very careful from the start to get the whole community involved. And we didn't talk about killing pests. In the, the day, pests are what we've got to kill, but we talked to local iwi groups about what they used to have and what they could have in the future. Um, we got dock and government involved, we got landowners involved and, um, and volunteers and said, hey, this isn't about killing pests. Do you want to see kaka in your backyard again? Do you want to see kaka in your backyard again? Do you want to get seabirds back in your hills? Do you want kiwis? Do you want tuatara? Do you want um, uh, pātiki? Um, and the answer is yes. So it's about working with all the different groups and find, trying to find some middle ground. No, farming isn't sustainable in New Zealand at the moment. No, recreational isn't sustainable in New Zealand at the moment. No, the way we live everyday life isn't sustainable how we live in New Zealand at the moment. So if you go to a farmer and say, Mr Farmer, won't you be sustainable? He'll lose money and go broke. So it's all about everyone accepting um, a vision now that we're not sustainable, but hey, how in 2050 can we be sustainable, working together? And so it's about working together with scientists, um, landowners, all the groups coming together about the vision. And that's the good thing about John Key's vision of 2050. Yes, it is achievable and we will reach it. Um, Cape Century now on farmland. Um, sorry, that was a slide I should have been talking about before. Um, some people say we've got the biggest diversity of native birds on mainland coastal New Zealand, um, or if we're not the biggest, we're one of the biggest. Um, and this is on farmland. Our biggest, our biggest threat to this whole project working was um, scientists and experts. 15 years ago, we got told this couldn't happen. 15 years ago, we got told we couldn't put Kiwis back here. 15 years ago, we got told that um, um, we were environmental vandals even trying to do these things. 15 years ago, we were told that, hey, unless you're pest free, you can't put anything back here. We said, well, it's too expensive to be pest free, but we can get down to 5% of pests. Is it acceptable? Um, 15 years ago, we were told, uh, just, you're experimenting, and yes, we were, but we, we have to experiment. And I think what, what scientists have to understand is we have to take risk. It's got to be educated risk for the best technology we have at the time, but we have to take risk to move forward. Um, we've got situations where we've been told to prick eggs in birds in um, Karka, actually, because um, there was no release site 
um, permit for a release site for them to go. This is the crap we put up with. We've got a three. We've been waiting for a per permit for three years for for um, for um, um, skink for that will become extinct where it is because people are taking crowbars are and stealing it, and so we've probably lost that species forever. Um, this is the rubbish we put up with, and I think we just got to we've got to be pragmatic about these things and um, and move forward. Um, I think here our only, our only real major failure is a saddleback. Um, we've still got them, but in small numbers they suspect to, um, to rats. Um, a big one for us was seabirds. Don Mertens once said to me, Andy, you've got to get into seabirds. So we've transferred 960 um, seabirds hundreds of thousands of dollars of private money spent over many years. But the, but the joy at the moment, uh, my wife Liz and, um, and um, Steve Sawyers were up there two nights ago, and the, sea, and the, and, and the, and, and the seabirds coming into, into the seabird site was unbelievable. They were also um, nesting outside the site, around the hills. So yes, we have got cats, yes, we have got ferret stoats and weasels and rats. Uh, yes, we have got a rabbit plague, which isn't helping. And I think that's another thing I've got two minutes need to talk about. Government needs to be quicker. You know, uh, Australia's just released a virus for, for rabbits. Now, we haven't released it here. Now, what's going to happen is some farmer is, that's costing them $100,000 a year for controlling rabbits in the South Island, he'll go and bring it in in an uncontrolled way and we won't get the full benefit. We need to be quicker on our, fault, on, on our feet. Um, education, unless we educate people with what we're doing, we, 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 we go nowhere. And finally, um, hey you guys, you're the start of, a, um, you're start of an ecological revolution. The flywheel's starting, so you can be, we're at the start of an ecological revolution now, and we look back in 20 years time and go, wow, we've made it. Thank you everyone. Uh, would we do anything different? I, I don't think, with what we knew then, I don't think so, no, but I think technology's changed now, so there's, um, there's, um, I, I think scientists and pragmaticness have to get together. I, I think with conservation, you, you, you put it in monetary terms, so for every dollar I put into conservation, I'm going to get four dollars out in conservation rewards. So I think we've got to start looking at it that way, and um, and making our dollars go a lot further. So that's the thing I'd look at more. One more, one more question: Can I persuade you to move to Gisborne to start again? Uh, you've got a fantastic project starting in Gisborne. You've got Young Nick's Head and people up there, and you've got um, um, Steve Sawyer's. Um, you've got some great guys up there doing some great things already.